Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first talk this morning. I'm really grateful that some of you got up this early to watch my talk. And we are talking about one question that everybody is concerned of. It's the usual question, what's up for lunch? No, it's not what's up for lunch. It's, will my hardware work with OpenSUSE? A lot of people are uh, thinking, shall I switch to Linux from my whatever Windows desktop? Uh, and they are concerned and say, well, I have no idea if my machine will work with SUSE or not or with Linux at all. And uh, why am I uh, entitled to tell you about this topic? I have to reflect a bit in my past. I'm a member of our SUSE employee uh, since 10 months. And in a former life, I was the guy responsible for Linux on the desktop uh, at Fujitsu. And we had a factory here in Germany, in Augsburg, where I'm located. And we developed uh, computers, desktop systems. And we developed everything. We developed um, mainboards, we developed housings, we developed uh, BIOS, we developed everything. And so I have a big um, experience in hardware compatibility testing, especially for Linux, because my job was to uh, get Linux on the desktop for 17 years. So after this intro, we can make it short. We can, this is the executive summary. You know Greg Kroa Hartmann, he's a well-known kernel developer, and in the Linux Symposium in 2006, in Ottawa, he said, Linux supports more devices out of the box than every other operating system ever has. And this quote is still true in 2022. It's uh, still valid. But uh, I don't want to stop here. That would be a really short talk. Uh, we should uh, look a bit at a typical uh, PC hardware. How does it look like? I made a nice, I uh, hope it's, it's nice, uh, diagram about how uh, a typical desktop PC is organized. You will have on the right side a graphics card that's, uh, depending on which card manufacturer you use, it will be either plugged in in a PCI Express slot or it will be even onboard inside the CPU. Uh, then desktops tend to have audio devices. They have a network interface today. Uh, you don't find any mainboard without network anymore. They have other interfaces. We have storage controllers. And of course, we have a lot of peripheral devices that we can connect to our PC. And whatever we are talking about, it's about hardware support. That means if uh, your hardware needs to be supported by Linux, the, the consequence is you need a kernel driver for that hardware. And uh, coming to kernel drivers, there is the first rule of thumb. Your kernel has to be newer than your hardware. I made a graph about the development cycles. And you know the Linux kernel is developed on kernel.org. There are the, the, the developers like Linus himself and Greg and so on and they release a new kernel practically every 10 to 12 weeks. That's the red bars that you see. And after every kernel release, there is a so-called merge window that is opening. That's the, the green uh, field. That's for two or three weeks, uh, there is a merge window. That means hardware vendors can supply driver code that will be merged into the next kernel version and so on. Every quarter of a year there will be a new kernel version. And now you see at the top there is some hardware provider, some hardware vendor that, that created the new network card and that network card code, okay, it created it practically shortly after the merge window from the previous version closed. That means he has to wait until the next merge window opens. But uh, the big problem is uh, usually you are not running 
uh, kernel.org kernels. You are running your distribution kernel. You are running what uh, OpenSUSE is installing on your device. And OpenSUSE has a different release cycle. If you see that the red bars in the OpenSUSE cycle, you see that there's one release and then it takes maybe 12 months until the next release. So now we are at the brink of uh, releasing leap 15.4. And the next version will be maybe one year ahead. And of course, uh, SUSE takes code from kernel org and tries to backport it on its own distribution kernel. But the question is, when are they taking the code? If they take the code also after their current release, they have a merge window, then you see the bar that is going down. It's just too early for that poor network driver card code that was not yet in the kernel, and it will have to wait a complete year until the next release, and we pull code from kernel.org again. That's the bad news. The good news is, if it's a really important device, a hardware vendor can provide additional driver code. It can provide a so-called driver update disk, because SUSE kernel, also Red Hat has this mechanism, they provide a way that you can say, okay, on install time, I can uh, merge another driver. The driver will be installed in the lib uh, modules directory, but not where the usual driver is. The driver uh, will be placed in another directory that is not overridden by kernel updates, but that is searched first when we load drivers. So if we supply a driver update, this will survive on one hand the kernel updates, on the other hand it will be loaded first when we load kernel modules and then we have an updated driver that works even when our distribution kernel is not major enough to support this. But anyway, the general rule of thumb is take hardware that is, in German we say, gut abgehangen, that means well done, that is already major and uh, on the market for a while, don't go for the latest and greatest uh, machine. They usually have not drivers and they also usually have some hardware problems that the uh, manufacturer has to sort out. I am talking from experience, so don't worry. So, when we think about drivers, the one thing we should look at is how does plug and play work? because uh, plug and play is, is great and in the beginning it was more called plug and play, but now it's uh, plug and play. And I made an example, I took one of my workstations uh, PCI device. You know the kernel when it boots, it does a PCI bus scan, it gets a long list of what devices do I have. And with this list it can determine what drivers do I need. And to do that, you look at the uh, information that LSPCI throws out when you ask for a special device. In this case, I was uh, telling them with minus S, this, uh, give me the device at this bus number and give it to me numerically and give me a bit uh, more information. And you get out that 1.f.2, uh, then you get out 106. When you look down, 1 is the device class. One is storage controller. Six is the device subclass. Six means SATA controller, serial ATA. Uh, then you have a vendor ID and a device ID. Vendor ID 8086 is Intel. And uh, 3822 is just a number. The number is important because usually when you do LSPCI without minus N, you get a text that says, this is the Intel, whatever chipset, SATA controller, and so that this uh, can be determined, there is a list of PCI device, devices that uh, has a key uh, that is vendor ID, device ID, and then there is a text that says, this is this device. Sometimes you, you, if you do uh, LSPCI, on a brand new system with an unknown chipset that is not yet in the list. You just get unknown device with the number of the uh, device ID. And then you maybe have a sub-vendor ID and the sub-vendor uh, device ID. 
In this case, it was 1734. That's the sub vendor ID for Fujitsu Siemens. And 1140D uh, is just a number again. So the kernel uh, loads, the kernel does a PCI bus scan, and then it says, give me all device IDs, and then let me see what drivers do I have. And for that, uh, the kernel, every module has uh, information about what um, devices it feels respons responsible for. So we can look at the, okay, so we can look at the uh, driver side of life. I took the AHCI driver that is responsible for the controller I just showed you. And in this case, when you do a mod info AHCI, you get the file name, where is that module located in my driver tree. So you see it's the 4.5.3.18, whatever, OpenSUSE kernel from leap 15.3. It has the version G3.0 under GPL. Description is AHCI SATA low-level driver. The author was Jeff Garzik. We even have a SUSE release here, so you can determine this is a driver from a SUSE kernel. You have a source code version, and then the important thing is you have those alias list. The alias list holds the vendor ID, the device ID, maybe even sub vendor ID, sub device ID, or the class ID. In this case, we match for BC, base class 01, sub class 06. So the driver doesn't care what device ID your device has. It says, okay, I'm lucky the device is class 01, subclass 06. I have a driver that is uh, practically match all uh, devices with base class 1 and subclass 6. And so your AHCI driver will be loaded and will be responsible for driving the um, SATA controller on your system. It's like quite easy. No, no magic at all. So plug and play is, is really explained easily. The same we have on the USB side. Whenever you plug in a USB system, let's say a memory stick, or in this case I, I made a LS USB on my Bluetooth dongle at home. So you see we also have a bus number, a device number, and then we have a Vendor ID, device ID, that's Cambridge, Silicon Radio, Bluetooth dongle, and then you get some descriptors and you see device class in this case is wireless, device subclass is radio frequency, device protocol is Bluetooth, and then down there you see ID vendor is 0A12, Cambridge, Silicon Radio, ID product is Bluetooth dongle. Easy as well. No magic, just numbers that match together. And inside the kernel, if, if you go in your libmodules module, you should find a file named alias. And there is a list of all the aliases that you see in the driver modules. So the kernel, when it wants to find out which module do I have to load, it goes through this list, matches classes or device IDs, and then it knows, okay, this is this driver or the other one. So when you ask yourself, will my hardware work with OpenSUSE or with Linux in general, how, how will I find out? I could uh, go to do this, uh, but that means I already have the hardware. Maybe if you want to buy a new machine, uh, you don't have the hardware, you can't look up the PCI IDs and so on. But there is a way. We are in OpenSUSE, and OpenSUSE is using the same kernel infrastructure than SUSE Linux Enterprise. And SUSE Linux Enterprise, you can certify hardware for. That was what I was doing for 17 years. There's a website that is called um, HTTPS www.suse.com slash yes search. Then you get a search form. You can put in the name of your machine or whatever or you search for vendors and so on. And on the right side, you see that you get a certification document. And SUSE certifications are great, really, because uh, SUSE, okay, what you can read at the top, product description, 
that is just marketing, blah, blah, that we uh, copied always from the data sheet where they praise the system in the best words and say, we have the best and greatest and latest and whatever system, but what is important is down the test configuration. So you see what hardware was in the test, and you see there was that special CPU, we had uh, an amount of memory, we had some drivers, maybe we even had another graphics card and so on. And if you get such a certification, that means you can be sure that your hardware works well with OpenSUSE. It might, might not be perfect. There might be configuration notes that says, okay, look, everything fine, but if you send the machine to sleep, accidentally it will never wake up again because they have BIOS problems and so on. But that's uh, the, the, the big difference in, in SUSE. When we did certifications, uh, you are certifying a machine as it is. So if I take this no uh, notebook here, I certify the machine, and I say, okay, I am certifying this machine for uh, OpenSUSE, and this is the configuration. We do some tests. Um, some tests are manual. Some tests are fully automated. At the end, you get a test result uh, file, and you submit this to SUSE, and then uh, your hardware... Your TAM, a technical account manager, will have a look at it if the results make sense and if the results are good. He says, okay, agreed, this machine is certified. Even if we have some minor flaws that say, okay, we have some problems, but uh, we talked about it, we are happy, we know where the problem is, so everybody can read, we have a problem here, but if you decide I want it anyway, it's fine. On the other hand, I also made uh, certifications for Red Hat, and that was quite different because Red Hat uh, says you have to certify every possible component that the customer can order, and you have to certify, um, how to say, every possible CPU and so on. It was a big mess, and if there was a problem, uh, we had, I don't know how many months of discussions if this is a real problem or if we just can say, okay, give an exception that is not really important for the daily life, but anyway. So now let's have a quick look at some components. I made the spotlight, you remember that the big uh, schematics diagram, now we put the spotlight on the graphics card. Uh, for graphics card, we have at the moment three major players. We have Intel, we have uh, Nvidia, and we have AMD that was former ATI that was uh, purchased by AMD. Uh, when I was starting with PCs, there was also Matrox around, but uh, it's long that I have seen a Matrox card anywhere. Uh, rule of thumb, if you are installing your system on your full, uh, let's say, HD or even 4K monitor, and uh, the installation screen comes up with uh, VGA resolution 640 by 480, then you are probably missing the correct driver. And when it comes to NVIDIA or AMD, uh, the thing is you can use open source drivers or you can use proprietary drivers. So in, for NVIDIA, the open source driver was Novo and the proprietary driver was NVIDIA. But recently, NVIDIA released an open source driver for their graphics cards. But uh, there are people around that say, okay, it's not a big uh, issue because they just moved the proprietary code to the firmware and now they released the, the open source driver as before. It's just the interface to the proprietary code. Same is true for AMD. Uh, they have uh, open source drivers, they have proprietary drivers. If you use a proprietary driver, there might be the need that you blacklist your driver so that not uh, two drivers uh, are in concurrence for one device. So if I install NVIDIA driver, usually I have a file in, lib mo in ETC modules that says blacklist no more. Okay, spotlight on audio devices. If we have audio devices on our main board, then uh, it's usually some plugs for speakers, some line-ins, even a microphone in. If you have a notebook, they have built-in microphones, they have built-in speakers. But uh, really, to be honest, all those devices, they are maybe enough to do some 
Jitsi calls or team calls or whatever, but if you want to go to audio production, that if, if let's say you are a musician and you want to do uh, audio workstation, then you should buy a external audio interface. And uh, the driver situation usually is that you have a sound uh, HDA Intel driver loaded and the driver provides the interface to the codec. There's a codec chip that then does all the magic that transforms your data into audio signals. If we look at the network, I mean Linux is a network operating system so we can be sure that every network interface will work. We have providers like Intel, Realtek, Broadcom. The big difference, just for fun, if Intel brings out a new uh, network card, you will have device uh, vendor ID 8086 and the new device ID, whatever it is. Even if the card is completely uh, compatible to the previous one, just with maybe one or two extra gimmicks, uh, you have a new uh, device ID for that card. That means you have to update your driver so that it knows about that device ID. When Realtek, uh, Realtek brings out a new network card, I guess uh, since 15 years the device ID of Realtek is just 8168, whatever it is, and the driver tries to find out what real card it has in front of it. We have, uh, as I told you, uh, LAN, local area network, uh, both copper cables or even fiber is supported. Wi-Fi is supported, but by, when it comes to Wi-Fi, you have to uh, be sure that you also have the maybe proprietary firmware installed in uh, kernel firmware, otherwise Wi-Fi won't work, Bluetooth will work, and even features like Wake on LAN are supported. So, if we put the spotlight on Interfaces. Interfaces we have a lot. We have USB support from the beginning, USB 1 to 3.1 or even 3.2 now, or when 4 comes, you can bet 4 will be supported as well. Uh, sometimes we have to tell you that it was a big issue when I had a Red Hat certification because we had a USB 3.1 generation 2 controller on the USB side that was entitled to do 10 gigabits per second, but it was connected to the main board with a PCI Express uh, interface that had a memory bandwidth of just around 7 megabits per second. So whatever you do, you were not able to, to provide the full speed for USB uh, 3.1 generation 2 because the other side of the interface was too slow. And we had, I guess, six months of discussion with Red Hat why we can't uh, change this because it was really a hardware problem. But on the other hand, I know no external device that will, uh, how to say, handle 10 gigabits per second uh, for a long time. So it was just a discussion uh, without any real application. We have uh, PS2 for the old keyboards and, and mouse uh, interfaces. We have even serial support. Serial support is very nice and important when it comes to kernel debugging because when you start your kernel, you can uh, redirect the kernel messages to a serial console. If you have a second PC connected, you can see what the kernel is throwing out. Even if your machine just flashes up and then your screen turns black and so on, you see the kernel messages and then you find out which driver is not working. You can have parallel interfaces for those who have still a parallel uh, Centronix printer, but they are practically close to extinction. You have even Firewire. I know I have an old um, digital camera, a video camera with, with small tapes uh, that uh, provides Firewire. We can have SCSI, you can have whatever. I mean, the, the interfaces, whatever interface you can think of, Linux will support it. Then when we look at storage, when I started with Linux, storage was floppy disk and uh, ATA hard disks. Today, mainboards provide SATA ports for internal drives or even the CD writers, Blu-ray writers, there's just a small SATA cable to every device. 
and uh, hard disks, uh, we support solid state disks today. No problem. Even there are two ways to, to connect the solid state disk. We can either go to media market and buy a 2.5 inch uh, SSD for your notebook that comes with a SATA interface and you just replace the, the old uh, disk drive with the new one works perfectly because it's just that the machine just sees a SATA disk. It doesn't care if this is on really disks or if this is a SSD. And the other thing is you can also use uh, NVMe, non-volatile memory express. This is uh, hard disks that are practically directly connected to your PCI express bus that offer a lot of speed and they are just small memory modules with one terabyte of storage. That, that's really great. And I think when I got my first PC, it had 80 megabytes of hard disk and it was the high-end system of the time. Uh, on storage, we even support RAID. RAID is supported on kernel level. That means uh, kernel provides drivers to, to build up a RAID with your hard disks that you have. But some uh, mainboard manufacturers come with, uh, we provide RAID for our workstation. And then they uh, add uh, some code to the BIOS that puts some RAID signature on the drives and uh, the rest is the job of the driver. So we can support those fake RAIDs, but uh, at the end it's just a software RAID. It's not a hardware RAID that you say I have a controller where I say I send you the, the packets that you have to write on disk and the controller manages the RAID. It's just the CPU that manages the RAID. If we put the spot on peripherals, you see we have a long list what we can use. We can use keyboard, mouse, whatever we connect it to, if it's uh, USB or PS2. Uh, if you are in gaming, you can use joysticks. Of course, USB joysticks uh, work fine. Uh, if you are a creative person, you want to sketch uh, some drawings and so on, you can buy a graphic tablet at Amazon and works perfectly with uh, software like Krita. Uh, card readers, if you are digital photography, you can uh, plug in a card reader, USB, that's uh, fine. You can read uh, micro SD, SD cards. The only thing that you have to take care of, that you maybe need an XFAT driver if your card uh, capacity is above 32 gigabytes. If you have FAT systems above 42 gigabytes, you need an XFAT kernel driver for the XFAT file system, but that's also part of OpenSUSE, so no problem at all. Uh, you can even use smart cards. German uh, Personalausweis is a smart card, wireless smart card. You can get a cheap wireless reader from Reiner SCT. I got one when the, the Personalausweis came out. That was really, that was a add-on to a German computer magazine, so it was for five euros, and you can plug it in. There is the Ausweis up to, and really I can uh, connect to official legal services with my personal Ausweis putting on the card reader works perfectly. The only thing that you have to, to take care of is that the card reader supports the CCID standard. You can add audio interfaces. I have a, I'm, I'm doing mu music at home as well, and I'm doing online tutorials, video courses, so I have an audio interface for professional microphones. Works perfectly, like a charm. The only thing is when you do music, you might compile your own late, low latency kernel, because uh, the thing is you have your microphone that goes to an uh, di uh, analog digital converter, and then goes into your computer, it processes it in the audio workstation software, it sends it back to the monitor speakers, and there's always a very small delay, that's the latency. And you want the kernel with very low latency so that you don't hear any echoes. When you have a webcam, today we are working remote, everybody wants to do video conferencing, we need webcams. There is the uh, universal video class, uh, device class for webcams, so if your webcam is UVC, it will work just because of the class code. We have external storage devices, USB storage. I have my, my USB memory here in my pocket. You can plug it and it will work. 
fun fact at the, the side note, uh, I once had a workstation certified for Red Hat and I had a very special, I don't know what was wrong with that USB stick, but when I plugged it in, in the kernel messages, I got a, a notice, kernel panic in 10 seconds. And 10 seconds later, the machine locked up. It was, uh, we never found out why, but it was really funny because it was the, the USB stick to kill every Red Hat machine around just by plugging it in. Yeah, you can have printers. I have printers, two printers at home, one office chat from, from HP that works perfectly with the HP lib uh, library and uh, USB or, or network support. Even the scanner works. I have a brother printer at home for, for the high level laser work. It works, uh, scanners work, everything works. So practically, uh, quoting Greg Kroa Hartmann again, Linux supports every device you want. Yeah, I, I, I really guess there are very little number of devices around that won't be supported. I know there is one thing that is a pen that you can write on a special paper and that digitizes it. Maybe this has no driver yet, but the average uh, hardware that people want to use, uh, they work. So that's my talk this early morning. I hope you didn't sleep off after a hangover from yesterday's party. Hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.